Now, a lot of those uh, orchards wasn't just Box Hill North. It was right in front of us here. This was uh, the centre of the Heidelberg School, the artist school, and um, um, they often used uh, these orchards as their subject. Now, I, I'm a member, of, as was just said, of um, the Box Hill Historical Society, but I'm wearing two badges. It's not that I don't know who I am, because I'm also a member of the Doncaster and Templestowe Historical Society, and the two districts play a complementary role. Um, I'll try to weave them together um, in order to discuss the heyday of the fruit shops. Um, uh, you're probably aware there was a fruit shop everywhere between the, the, the 20s up to the 80s. You could go to any uh, strip and um, shopping strip and there would be two, three fruit shops and they were all doing really well. Now, Box Hill, of course, was the railway and population centre. Um, it became very strongly residential, uh, built around the railway station, and Doncaster became the largest fruit growing area in Australia. Uh, linked, the two were linked by a, a, an electric tram. Um, so, let's face it, if you're going to talk about uh, fruit, you might as well start with the trees. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll commence now. Um, uh, I'm commencing with, with a slide which comes out of this book. Uh, there's a series of three which the Box Hill Historical Society sell, and um, this was probably the, the first undercover market in Box Hill uh, during the Depression. Um, it, um, it was uh, started by a guy called Morton, who was a, a local mason, and during the Depression things got tough, so he started selling fruit. But this was just before the big boom. Okay, what, what, what we're going to rush through today, and we will rush because this is a one-hour topic, and uh, um, <laughs> I'll just move through the, the main points. So I hope it's not a, a one blur, but um, initially fruit and vegetables were sold in open markets. There was an abundance of orchards and homegrown produce close to home, so there was no need for fruit shops. There actually were no fruit shops at the beginning. Um, they were just, people sold fruit, but they were general stores and they mainly sold um, aerated water, which later became lemonade. People got sick of uh, drinking water, so, uh, lemon was put in, and that's where we get the word lemonade from. Um, something happened in the uh, mid-20s. Um, there was a massive rise in, in fruit shops, and we'll find out why in a second. And um, it was mainly brought about by the ability to bring from Queensland a certain fruit which, um, which made going into a fruit shop a must. And we'll look at the evolution of the fruit business. Um, the fruiterers from about the 1920s onwards were completely dominated by Italians. Now, I'll just start with the open air market. This is Box Hill on Market Street. You can actually see the name Morton over there, who um, was really big in Box Hill. He's buried in Box Hill Cemetery. He's part of our cemetery tour, which I do uh, frequently. Box Hill. Um, this uh, was was where you, you got your, your fruit. Um, you can see it all being, being sold along there. Um, but one of the things that characterised the early days was the actual limited uh, uh, both quantity and, and quality and variety of fruit. Um, starting at Doncaster, uh, this is where Schramm's Cottage is today, which is the headquarters of the uh, Doncaster and Templestowe Historical Society, and um, uh, this uh, the, the building, the white building in the middle, is uh, is still there. It's the oldest building in Doncaster. Next time you go to Ruffy Park, you'll you'll see it. But what I want to highlight is all the um, uh, various orchards uh, and what the place actually looked like. This was settled by German people. 
Uh, in fact, the uh, Germans um, were the pioneers of fruit growing in Doncaster. And there's uh, Tunstall Square. Again, you can just see everywhere there's orchards, so I'll, I'll just shoot through them. Um, this is one of my favourite uh, pictures. One of the early German uh, settlers were the, the Genyas, and um, there's a little boy down there. Do you see him? Everyone's working, and he's enjoying a peach. <laughs> and uh, this family run orchards, the Tippets. Um, this was just down the road here. We could actually see it if they were still there. We would um, just point them out right over there. And uh, um, this was typical of a family run orchard. And just to show you just how many orchards there actually were, um, this is Whitehorse Road around the turn of the century because <coughs> you can see uh, the Box Hill Oval. That's <coughs> Box Hill Oval, that's Middleborough Road, and here's Whitehorse Road, and you know how it how it curves. Mm. Now look at this, there's this is Laburnum, there's orchards everywhere, but you can see the houses starting to spring up along the railway line. <coughs> And um, this is a familiar sight to all of us because we travel down this all the time. This is Station Street going up to Doncaster and that curve in the road is still there. And as you know, the freeway cuts right across here because it's on the low side. That's where the creek was. Um, and but what I'm highlighting is uh, the, the orchards in Doncaster. And uh, if ever you visit the Doncaster and Templestowe Historical Society's Museum, the on-site museum at Shrams Cottage, uh, there is a, a whole area there devoted to the history of, um, of fruit growing in that region. And there were some very famous um, people who are part of the cemetery tour who started the, um, well, they were celebrity growers, I suppose. This was uh, William Cook, one of the, the great pioneers. He uh, made a name for himself um, growing cherries. And they'd have an annual fruit uh, show in Box Hill uh, around the turn of the century. And I love the sign in the middle. It says, caution. Do you see that? It says, anyone caught pilfering uh, this fruit? And obviously, people went to the show and took home, <coughs> took home some souvenirs. And we sent to England. No, no, he just wouldn't do that. No, 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 that wouldn't. Um, now, fruit was, was readily available even up until the 1960s, straight from the orchard. This is the Blackburn uh, Blue Moon. Um, they closed in the late 60s. But I'm just saying to you, there was no real need to go into a fruit shop uh, because everything was just so nearby. And that's why there were no, effectively uh, no large scale fruit shops. Now this was the, the very first, and uh, you know that corner, the corner of Rutland Road and Station Street, that building is still there, Allingsworth Corner, and you'll see here Box Hill Fruit and Vegetable Supplies. That was, that was the first fruit shop uh, in, in Box Hill, which you could say was an actual shop, but it, it sold very little in by, by way of fruit. And this one was in Carrington Road, opposite to where that huge building is going up now. Uh, that was Watkins' shop. Again, uh, produce was, was rather scarce and he made his living selling other things. But what happened in the 19, early 1920s was that something really dramatic happened. Um, when the soldiers came back after World War I, uh, They'd been in, in warm climes and they discovered something which, which everyone was to come to love, and that was bananas. And um, the fact is, you couldn't get bananas to Melbourne because they don't grow this far south. And the roads, everything was so terrible. You just couldn't get them here before they went black. And um, you know, they always had cool stores. Of course, that was the mainstay of the uh, Doncaster and Templestowe fruit business, but you can't put bananas in a, in, a, in a fruit refrigerated situation because as you know, they turn black. They don't ripen, they just go black. So no one knew how to get bananas to Melbourne. But then, um, 
technology always finds a solution and um, they discovered that and by the way, they tried to trick the bananas into making them think they were in Queensland. They used to put them in, in warm um, chambers. They used to burn wood to raise the temperature. They oil, oil they were burning oil. They tried everything. The bananas just would, would not respond. But then they realized that what ripens a banana is ethylene. And this is why when you want to ripen a banana, fruit give off uh, ethylene, bananas in particular, and uh, that's why you put them in a plastic, in a, a paper bag. Uh, it's the ethylene that does it, and when they learned how to control um, ethylene, uh, the, the bananas started to come uh, to Melbourne, and people started to invest in bringing them out, and it caused the sensation. The people loved them, and the fruiterers um, were there to take advantage, and the first one to take advantage was in fact the Shinkotas. Um, some of you, are you from Box Hill, some of you? Because it um, was mentioned that a lot of you are over 50. I think that was a bit of a joke. Um, if, if you are, you might actually remember the Shinkotas in Station Street. They were the first to, to cash in on the ability to, to get bananas down from uh, Queensland and into the shop. So all of a sudden, everyone's got to go into a fruit shop. Now, they were Italians. Uh, this is their daughter, by the way, uh, Maria, who I, who I, I meet regularly. Um, uh, Maria, you can see the way the, the shops uh, were, were set up, even by the late 40s. They were still selling aerated water, um, and eventually the, the lemonade was to disappear. And, and they concentrated just on fruit once you get into the 50s and so on. Um, in that same shop, uh, that was um, Sam and Yolanda Shinkata. Um, that was um, Jerry's brother. Eventually, he went off and uh, set up his own shop in St Kilda. But I'm just showing you this, uh, just to give you an idea of um, the prominence that bananas would uh, display um, as time went on and then they became a mainstay. Today we don't think twice about them, we've just become spoiled as, as we have in so many other ways. Now, this is um, the, the, the situation then. Um, the fruit shops boomed in the 1920s up to the end of World War I. There was a, a limited variety of produce. Um, yep, they sold lemonade and all sorts of other things. Um, Orchards were not too far away. There were very poor links with Northern Australia. There were very few tropical ex exotic fruits and the Italians later were to enhance the, the variety of produce. They were really the first of the um, migrants to come to Australia in large numbers and they introduced zucchinis and broccolis and the aubergines and the endive and fennel, capsicum, garlic, you name it, um, they started to stock the, the stores and uh, people took a liking to some of this stuff. Uh, there was also the wide acceptance of tomatoes. Um, people of um, Anglo-Irish background were very suspicious of tomatoes for a long, long time. In fact, they come from the nightshade family. Uh, people were being poisoned by them, but the people didn't realise it's the leaf of a tomato that's poisonous. So they'd, they'd cut them up, put them in the salad. People were sick and they blamed the tomatoes. So people were very suspicious of handling tomatoes. Um, the Italians, of course, uh, for them, tomato is, is uh, the basis of um, spaghetti sauce. And, um, you know, people started thinking, we could buy some of this stuff. So there was this huge uh, acceptance of, of that, that type of fruit. Um, now here's a, um, you probably know this, um, this location. Um, this is Market Street. Can you see Market Street there, which today takes you to Box Hill Central. Um, cars and buses used to go down there, it's hard to believe. But it was called Market Street because we saw a picture before of the market that was there uh, in that very street. And uh, I'm just showing you this picture because um, Don Watson <coughs> had his shop, and you can actually see his name. 
people still remember him. His grandson actually is the uh, coach of the Box Hill Cricket Club, and uh, he used to be an AFL umpire. Um, he too was very well known during that that time of the growth of the shops. In fact, that's him here um, on the left, and his mate uh, Charlie Viteri. Uh, they had a partnership. Now, I'll just mention that you can actually date a shop by the prices. Um, <laughs> people, experts will tell you immediately the actual year. Uh, uh, that this was prior to decimal currency. Now, there used to be a, a tremendous parade in Box Hill. I remember as a kid, I used to love the parade. And this was um, Don Godso, and you can see there, this is his truck and he's driving. He'd never lend, lend his truck to anyone else. And they used to do a send up of, um, of Mardi Gras, even before Mardi Gras started. So they were, they were um, having a lot of fun even back then. But uh, Don always um, lent his truck. Now, I'll just say that um, by the mid-60s, we tend to talk about Italian fruiterers. All the, all the Italians came from one region. This is the thing that people don't understand, is that um, these were not Italians from all over Italy. They came from a particular <coughs> island chain, which is known as the Aeolian Islands. And this is an aerial shot of Italy. You see these tiny little islands, 85% of uh, the fruit business, um, uh, their owners came from just those few islands, one of which was um, the Dufinas. I love this photograph, it's very historic because today at this very location, which is the corner of Carrington Road and, and Station Street, there is that huge building they're doing at the moment, and it's right on this spot. And I remember Mum used to take us into the State Savings Bank on the corner, you might remember it. But um, the Finas, you can, you can see them right at the end there on the extreme right. So we're just going to look at a couple of, um, of fruiterers of the period, because the Finas were um, also from those islands. They were from Filagordi, which, uh, uh, in fact, all of them came from those islands. And this is Joe. Um, Joe was the only guy I ever knew back then to have tattoos. And he always used to say to me, um, he'd, show me he'd show me his tattoos and he'd say, you know, only idiots do this. And um, um, just as well, there are very few idiots around. But look, today, of course, tattoos are, are just so... Um, he always regretted those. That's what I remember most about Joe. A very popular fruiterer. Um, here's, um, um, you know, this uh, location on Whitehorse Road. Um, there, there's a shop there on the on the left. It says fruit and vegetables. Vegetables. This is the the Russos. That's another shop taken about ten years later. You can tell by the, 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 not only can you date a photograph by the um, uh, the prices on the fruit shops, it's also the cars. So this is a guy I knew. He, he owned that particular shop, Joe Russo, um, and. He and his brother had, a, had another shop uh, around the market. Um, in fact, I met him recently and he told me about uh, the old days. I used to f go with my dad to market in the morning. Now, this is, we call him the Lone Aussie. You've heard of the Lone Ranger. Uh, there was one Aussie guy who, who tried to compete against the Aeolians, uh, uh, the Italians. And, and his name was Stackers, and he's right outside the, the station today. This is the and this is Mark, uh, this is Bank Street, and uh, you can see it hasn't changed Bank Street because it, it it sort of continues along the railway line. But this here was the entrance to the railway station, and Stackers he was determined to survive, and what he did was he started probably the first self-serve. You know where it says self-serve? There was no way the Italians would let you handle fruit. Um, um, and uh, of course there was Fedelazzo, who's now buried in, uh, um, uh, they're all buried in Box Hill. I'll just jump through it because you might remember uh, Angelo D'Agostino. Um, he's, uh, he's uh, as I say, um, 
uh, and look, Lepore, um, he was on Canterbury Road here, 888, and um, he doesn't live far from here, actually. Uh, this is his shop, and this is very typical. They used to love taking photos of each other's shops. Um, very colourful. Uh, fruit has always been a colourful business. Uh, this particular person was at the corner of Woodhouse Grove and Station Streets. Um, I knew him, Marimo Alamo, um, from a very famous fruiting family. His father started in the 20s. Made a, they all made a fortune, these guys, but things were getting tough at the end because the supermarkets moved in. Uh, and this is, this is what, uh, what ultimately happened. This is actually my father. He was a fruiter from 1930 to 82. And uh, that's him in his apron when he came to Australia and um, uh, moving along. He had a unique business because his fruit shop was a mobile one. And he had customers and he visited them every week. And we used to load uh, his combi van up and uh, you'd tap on people's door and uh, they'd leave you an order. So he was a mobile fruiter. Um, I'll move along the, the corridor. Um, the uh, Marinda Corridor. This is Joe Luca. I just want to highlight two things here. One is the sign which says, please do not handle the fruit. This was absolutely unheard of, uh, self-serve. Uh, Stack has uh, tried to, to break that, but um, uh, there's no way the Italians would have you touch their fruit, probably because people would create a, a landslide. Um, <laughs> and, and this is, was, was when he retired. You see, he started in 1950, and when he retired, 65 years later, that's what he looked like, and um, he, he never left the, the fruit business. Yeah, and uh, I've only got a couple of more slides. Um, this is uh, the Toscano family in queue. They're still going, but... Uh, uh, the title of this slide is Selling Fruit as a Lifestyle. People just think it's a lot of fun and um, it was actually hard work getting up early in the morning. And um, nowadays, um, the fruit, those fruit shops have gone. What happened to them was that they were displaced by the supermarkets and eventually they, they all closed down. So today, fruit becomes a kind of health thing um, and everybody spruiks it, but um, in um, in a different way. All right, well, that's a uh, you know, uh, well done. Uh, Any questions? Quick, take one or two questions. Yes. In 1972, in Station Street, there was a, a mini war between the fruiters. One operator decided to sell organic. Yes, that's true. And, and uh, uh, That's exactly right. It's interesting you know that because I have the actual cutting, the newspaper cutting, where he got fined. Um, he was, um, that was a controversial time when people were trying to spruik things as organic, as they do now with open range eggs, and they were exposed as, as having the same produce as everyone else. But you're dead right about that. And um, that guy uh, was actually one of the the, the mansions, which was the Filazzos. Um They eventually uh, struck that word out, but he, he wasn't, and I think one of the reasons he, he, a lot of people didn't like it was that he wasn't an Aeolian, he had actually married into the, that family, <laughs> and he had acquired the shop, he had no love for fruit, and uh, it just uh, was that, it was, yeah, he, he acquired it uh, through his wife, that shop.